we will now move to the next uh, part of our discussion this is uh, ECB involvement in crisis management in, in different countries we have a whole wealth of experience in this field uh, we have the Greek experience of course of this involvement uh, major involvement of the bank in uh, management of crisis and uh, events showed clearly that the ECB uh, played uh, a major role, a political role. Uh, they exercised pressure in order to impose a policy. Uh, the decision taken by ECB in February 2015 is a case in point, deciding to stop the financing of the uh, Greek banking system uh, at a time when there was a program running because they argued that well the program was in jeopardy there was a lot of uncertainty so they argued uh, they had to uh, stop or interrupt the funding and of course this was exercise of political pressure Obviously, uh, these issues are now going to be covered by uh, Percy Doherty from Sinn Féin. He's the spokesperson on uh, economic affairs. He's also a member of the Irish Committee uh, of Inquiry into the banking crisis. Uh, Ireland, of course, has had its own banking crisis. And there was a, a, a lot, a huge upheaval at the time. And we've got Mr. Doherty. Uh, Dimitris, uh, and I'm very glad to be here uh, at this important conference uh, in relation to the ECB. There are two aspects to the ECB's involvement with Ireland during the, re during the recent crisis that I would like to focus on here today uh, in this session. The first is the ECB itself. Well, the second looks at the political and the economic establishment in Ireland that broadly welcomed the approach that was taken by the ECB. In fact, when it came to the implementation of austerity in Ireland, the ECB was pushing an open door. This does not mean that the ECB's dealings with Ireland were fully legal or that it acted within its mandate. It clearly did not only that it was not challenged by the establishment in any meaningful way. And this leads to the overall theme of this talk, that when we talk about the ECB and other EU institutions and their relationships with Ireland, we should not talk of Ireland as a single voice or set up the arguments as one of the ECB versus Ireland. There were those in Ireland who endorsed and supported the actions of the ECB. For the most part, they were the state apparatus, the media, the establishment parties. And then there were those who did not, and among those numbers were Sinn Féin. And this is one of the main tensions in Irish society today, and I think it's fair to assume that it is also the case in other countries who have suffered the whip of the ECB and other EU institutions over the past seven years. There is no doubt about it that the political sands are shifting, and where they will settle we are not quite sure. But it is our goal in Sinn Féin to be in a position to shape that future and not just to react to it. And what this means is that when we talk about the actions of the ECB, we should still acknowledge the fact that within the member states that there are those who support what is going on. And that means that the fight for the hearts and minds is not a simple message of reform at EU or ECB level. We need to win that argument at home as well as in our communities at local levels as well as here in Brussels. And that is the overall thrust of my talk this morning and of what I hope to do is to explain what that means 
in terms of progressive politics by looking at the experience of Ireland during the recent crisis and the role that the ECB played in protecting the status quo and protecting a system that failed us. From the start of the crisis back in 2008, the ECB made it clear that it did not see the needs of Ireland and the so-called periphery states as material to monetary policy. How do we know this? We know this because in July 2008, Jean-Claude Trichet was asked in an interview about the different national business cycles within the Eurozone and was questioned on what could have been done for countries like Ireland, Spain and Portugal. At that time, all of these countries were experiencing problems and Ireland was in recession, although not officially recognised until a couple of months later when the official quarterly figures appeared. When that question was put to Jean-Claude Trichet, he replied, and I quote, the ECB has to care for the superior interests of the euro area and our monetary policy must be optimal at the level of the whole euro area. But that didn't stop Jean-Claude Trichet from giving policy advice to Ireland, to Spain and Portugal when he went on to say there are numerous aspects of economic policies which are under the responsibilities of the countries themselves, in particular fiscal policies, the structural policies and the surveillance of the evolution of unit labour costs. Ireland's descent into recession without doubt had monetary policy implications, but the ECB didn't see it that way and reacted by telling Ireland and by telling other so-called peripheral countries to cut wages, to weaken labour laws in order to make things better. The peripheral countries were to cut their way to growth. In other words, growth-friendly fiscal consolidation. And that remains the policy and the mantra of the ECB today. Whatever the problem, the solution is cut wages and government social spending, as well as weakening labour law protections. Even when it's the banks, even when it's the ECB that mess up, the, cut, the solution from them is always the same. Cut wages and attack the weak. The programme of cuts in a recession not surprisingly made things worse. We know this from the experience of Ireland from 2008 to 2014. We know from the studies that have been conducted that austerity increased the national debt. A recent report by the economist and former head economist of the Economic Social Research Institute, John Fitzgerald, estimated that a fall in Irish GDP of 3.6% is directly attributable to government austerity measures which were endorsed by the ECB and from November 2010 onwards were demanded by the ECB as part of the Troika programme. From 2010 to 2013, which was the official period of the Troika programme, austerity measures alone reduced the numbers of those working in Ireland by 3.5%. Only a dramatic increase in immigration kept the number of Irish unemployment rate below 15%. And with the regards to the negative effects of austerity, a recent paper published by the Irish Central Bank concluded that fiscal consolidation is responsible for between one-third and one-half of the decline of the euro area's output gap from the beginning of 2011 until the end of the recession in 2013, with the share rising to about 80% in the presence of enhanced financial frictions. Moreover, it goes on to say, most of the output costs of fiscal consolidation could have been avoided if it had been postponed until the zero lower bond constraint on monetary policy was no longer binding and under such conditions the government debt to GDP ratio could have been reduced much more quickly. The effect of seven years of austerity has been enormous in Ireland. The cost of the crisis and the official policy responses to it has fallen disproportionately on the weakest in society, those least prepared to and least able to bear the impacts of these policies. We knew that this was going to happen. 
we who argued against austerity were not listened to. Our voices at the time were neither organised enough nor strong enough to combat the wave of establishment approval for the lie that you can cut your way to growth. The worsening fiscal position of the Irish state, the collapse of the construction sector, the enormous banking debt that was piled onto the shoulders of the Irish people, and the move by the Irish Government to double down on these problems with an austerity agenda played out to its inevitable conclusion. By the year 2010, the Irish state was in finding itself increasingly difficult to raise sustainable debt on the international markets. The ECB's strong exposure to Irish bank debt caused the ECB to panic. And what they did was on the 19th of November 2010, Jean-Claude Trichet wrote to the Irish Finance Minister regarding the Irish financial situation. And he gave him an ultimatum. Either accept the Troika programme or see your banking sector collapse through a direct response from the ECB in the case of withdrawal of emergency liquidity assistance funding to your financial institutions. Trichet said the following in his letter, a letter that was kept secret from the Irish public for four years until the banking inquiry was established. There there are four demands that Trichet made of the Irish Government at that time. The first two are, it is the position of the Governing Council that it is only if we receive in writing a commitment from the Irish Government vis-à-vis the Eurosystem of the four following points that we can authorise further provisions of ELA to financial institutions. Two of those points were, the Irish Government shall send a request for financial support to the Eurogroup, and the second, that the request shall include a commitment to undertake decisive actions in the areas of fiscal consolidation, structural reforms, financial sector restructuring, in agreement with the European Commission, the IMF and the ECB. This was a clear and unambiguous threat to the Irish people. Do as we say, or we will no longer be a lender of last resort to your banking system. The ECB wasn't looking for a government guarantee. It was looking for specific fiscal and political policies to be undertaken as a precondition for continuation of ELA. The letter and ultimatum were completely outside the remit of the ECB. Here we have a central banker, an unelected official with no democratic uh, mandate, dictating political policy to a sovereign state within the Eurozone. He made it clear in that letter that there was no room for negotiation. It was the ECB's way or the highway. That was it. Trichet and the ECB were quick to pretend that the Eurozone is a happy family with a common purpose, with a common destiny and slow to accept the reality of the multi-tiered Eurozone, one that they have created. And I saw this with my own eyes as a member of the Bank and Inquiry Committee when Trichet appeared before a public meeting to answer questions from that committee. And when he was questioned about this threat to the Irish state, he said he simply gave advice to the Irish government that Ireland should sign up to a bailout programme and not burn any bondholders. But when we asked this for, the former senior official in the Department of Finance what he thought of Trichet's words about just giving advice, Kevin Cardiff told the Bank and Inquiry, he said, there was in fact generally nothing simple about the ECB's giving of advice. When the ECB gave advice in relation to joining the EU IMF programme, the implied or else was very clear from Trichet's letters. If you don't do this, your banks will lose access to ECB and even national central bank support with disastrous consequences for your country. And this is borne out by the letter that has now been published from Trichet. But yet the self-delusion of the ECB remains. In April 2012, Jörg Amundsen, a member of the executive board of the ECB, gave a talk in Dublin entitled The Irish Case from an ECB Perspective. By that stage, the ECB was playing a major direct role in Irish society through the Troika programme, 
and indirect through skewered monetary policy. In his speech, he said something that went to the heart of the strategy that underpins the ECB's approach to the ongoing crisis. He said, The financial crisis has clearly added to the Irish debt burden, but we must not lose sight of the continued high deficits run in Ireland that must be brought under control. Whether inside or outside monetary union, fiscal consolidation would be required in the best interests of the country. In other words, the causes of the financial crisis should be treated separately to the consequences of the crisis. It is a self-serving argument, ideological in nature, and one made to deflect attention from the broken ideas that underpin the ECB that, and helped cause the crisis in Ireland in the first place. But the ECB is part of the story. The other is the Irish establishment itself, an establishment that embraced austerity as a solution to its decision to save vested interests in banking and in construction over the interests of the state. In Ireland, there were eight austerity budgets between 2008 and 2014, resulting in total cuts of €18.5 billion Euro and new tax measures on a depleted workforce amounting to €12 billion. Euro. Social spending in health, housing, education, welfare were the main areas that were targeted. Public service employment cut by 10%, health spending cut by 27%, rapid increase in homelessness, coupled with legal repossession notice issued to 50,000 homeowners. There was also a complete monitorium on capital spending, one result of which we saw this month severe flooding in our country uh, across many parts uh, of the state. And in November 2010, negotiations began with the Irish Government on the tro- with the Troika programme. The banking inquiry received first-hand testimony as to the nature of these negotiations. The official leading the Irish delegation, Kevin Cardiff, said in a statement to the inquiry, and I quote, he said, the National Recovery Plan 2011-2014, this is a recovery plan by the Irish Government themselves, was finalised in time to be the main influence on major parts of the programme. Rather than negotiate separate arrangements, the Troika partners were happy to accept the four-year plan that has been developed in Ireland and to build on it. And for the most part, it was a negotiation between people with more or less a common view of the world. We might have differences of view, for example, on fiscal policy or economic adjustments, but in truth, the differences were small enough. As we expected, the Troika were not dissatisfied with our plan. In some ways, it was more ambitious than they might have expected in regard to structural reforms. Of course, he said, there remains differences arising from differences in economic forecasts, but the basic thrust was generally acceptable to them. This was the Irish government at that time falling over itself to impose austerity on the Irish people. And once the ECB were happy that it would be paid its ELA, it was also happy for the Irish government to work away essentially on its own programme. This love of cuts as growth was not limited to the party, uh, uh, parties of government, which were Fianna Fáil and Greens at the time, but also by some of the opposition parties at that time, opposition parties which are now in government. Fine Gael, which is a member of the EPP, ran on a promise in the last elections to burn the bondholders, a promise of burden sharing as a way of alleviating some of the debt that has uh, been placed on the shoulders of the Irish people. But the party quickly changed its tune as soon as it entered office. In March 2011, the Irish Cabinet made a Cabinet decision that they would announce burden sharing with senior unguaranteed bondholders. As the speech was drafted for Minister Noonan to announce in the chamber that day, he received a phone call, as was referred to earlier by MEP McCarthy, from Jean-Claude Trichet. According to Michael Noonan, the Minister for Finance, he told the Bank and Inquiry that Jean-Claude Trichet told him a bomb would go off in Dublin if there was any burning of bondholders. Now, Trichet disputed the use of the word bomb, but he did tell the inquiry what I certainly said, because we had discussed it at the Governing Council of the ECB, was that it was unwise to do that. 
the Governing Council of the ECB considered it not appropriate for Ireland in the situation which Ireland was one of the worst you could imagine to go along this burning that you would have probably a lot of very adverse consequences. He went on to say it was finally what was decided by the government. If I am not misled, the decision was not taken by the ECB. But yet we know that the decision was taken and forced upon the Irish government by the ECB. I'll leave it to the audience themselves to decide whether or not it was advice or whether it was an ultimatum. But this was happening at a time when the National Treasury Management Agency in Ireland, an agency which is responsible for selling Irish government debt, had advised, had informed the Irish government that the markets had already expected and priced in the burden sharing for unguaranteed senior debt. But what we know is that Minister Noonan spent two phone calls with Jean-Claude Trichet and a cabinet decision was overturned because of the ECB's involvement. It is very clear that the Irish government have failed in any real and meaningful way to negotiate on behalf of the Irish people in relation to burden sharing. It is very clear that that burden is now being felt by the Irish people as a result of it. But this incident does shed some light on the ideological and political dynamics that we are faced with in the Eurozone and the EU today. Whether or not the Irish Finance Minister wanted to burn bondholders is a question that we still don't know. The fact remains he was not exactly going to fight for the issue. And why should he? It is not in the interest of the party he represents. It is an ideological position that they have. In highlighting these events, I'm not trying to set up an argument where the ECB is bad and the Irish establishment is good, or one of the ECB good and the Irish establishment bad. There is a merging of interests between money and power at a national and EU level. And it is a merger that is profoundly anti-democratic, despite the fact that they have set up seemingly democratic EU institutions to sustain and reproduce themselves. The EU elite is not just in the EU institutions. It doesn't survive simply through rules. The Troika delegation that showed up in Ireland was less than a couple of dozen people. The Troika was able to do what it did seamlessly as it did because in Ireland it was dealing with, for the most part, like-minded people. A political and financial elite who received a severe shock in 2008 but who have rode the wave of the crisis and have come out the other side smaller, leaner maybe, but just as entrenched in the system as before. These are the challenges that we face and greater integration of the member states into the Eurozone-wide fiscal and political system will not bring greater democracy and accountability to these institutions but will only serve to further consolidate and control the control that they have over our lives. From a democratic perspective, the Eurozone is not in a good place. The actions of the ECB with regard to the crisis management in Ireland over the past eight years does not bode well for the future. How we can democratise the Eurozone without breaking it apart is one of the key challenges facing all progressives today. It can be done, although it will be difficult. But the process has to happen in the member states as well as Brussels and Frankfurt. We forget that at our peril. Gurmaigam, thank you. And hopefully I remain within the time allowed. Thank you, uh, Piers Doherty, uh, for that contribution. Uh, you just slipped over the 20 minutes mark. Uh, so thank you for sticking to your time. I think uh, that uh, you've given us a very tangible, uh, painful but a tangible history of what happened with dates, names, facts, uh, events, which demonstrate uh, the uh, intervention of the ECB uh, under the Trichet uh, era. Uh, and how it intervened in the Irish crisis uh, and uh, the different interests involved, uh, political, financial uh, interests uh, and how the interplay took place at a European level. 
uh, one of the uh, points uh, w uh, is that the struggle against this regime is not always an institutional regime, but it serves uh, social and ideological interests. The struggle uh, has to be fought at a national level and a European level simultaneously. Uh, these are the opposing uh, ideologies and parties in each individual member state uh, and at the same time here in Brussels and uh, 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 that's uh, uh, why it's important to hear about these events. Uh, these are anti-democratic interventions uh, and we at the same time uh, have to uh, defend our own uh, proposals, our own ideologies.